Church, what a wonderful Sunday with blessings of rain. What a blessing this morning that we got Pastor Celia here with us. I'm going to make a special appeal as she minister the word. Please don't leave this church if there's issues that you need to sort out. We got an altar for you to come. If you want to cry, Pastor Cecilia is ready to feed you with that anointing spirit of God, so when you go out, you can say to yourself, what a blessed servant. This morning we want to welcome Cecilia here. She's always available. Pastor Gus pressed the button, then she just said yes before he talks. <laughs> and I want you to give her a warm welcome for offering up her time in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for the lovely warm welcome. Uh, yeah, Gus and I have done a little swap So Gus is at Milnerton this morning and then Brooklyn. And I'm here and we were comparing notes last night about orders of service and it's interesting how things are done slightly differently across societies. Absolute pleasure to be with you this morning. And I welcome you all and we give thanks to God for this lovely rain after the heat that we've had. Our call to worship as we gather to worship in God's name is from Psalm 22. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vow. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. Amen. <coughs> Let's spend a moment in prayer. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that we can meet freely here this morning. We thank you for your presence among us. Spirit, we welcome you. We ask that you would work in our hearts, that you would ease our troubled minds, strengthen our frail bodies, that your love and your power and your mercy. Lord, we are aware that during the week just past, perhaps there were times we did not behave as true disciples of yours. Perhaps there were times we did not glorify you through our actions and our thoughts. So we come before you, Lord, with contrite hearts. Ask, Lord, that you would forgive. Forgive the things that we have done wrong and the things that we should have done but did not. We thank you, Lord, for your sense of forgiveness. Puts our sins as far as the east is from the west. We thank you for the redeeming work of your Son on the cross, Lord, that we can take such great hope in. Lord, continue with us this morning as we pray, as your son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into Deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory for 
ever and ever. Amen. I think I'm fading in and out here a bit. A bit of a sound thing. Tell you what, while we sort out the sound, would you like to get on your feet, greet the person next to you, greet the person behind you, greet the person in front of you, with the love of the Lord. One, two. I think it might just be a... Hello, hello, hello. Maybe we should just try drop it. Maybe it's about you. Constant stream of sound, dropping again. Hello. You may all be seated. I'm coming down to your level now. To be honest, I feel much more comfortable here. I can't see you guys over there. And <laughs> don't trust myself. Folks, let's stand, let's worship the Lord. The worship team has prepared some beautiful praise songs for us to enjoy. Let's be on our feet. Yeah. 
We give you all the praise, we give you all the glory, we give you all the honor for everything that you are in our lives. Continue with us now in this service, this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Have, please be seated. Wasn't expecting you to do an endurance. <laughs> we have some notices, I think, in the offering. Notices, thank you. Good morning, all. Um, just quickly, are there any visitors here today? Please just put up your hand. No, we have to charge you double, eh? <laughs> Welcome. Please, um, there's a visitor's book over there, but just see me afterwards and then we can just uh, explain anything that you need to know about the church. Uh, birthdays during the week? Oh, nobody got older. <laughs> Birthday. <laughs> um, wedding anniversaries? No, nobody? Okay. Just to let you know that everybody's welcome in this church, and please, if there are any questions or anything, you can speak to myself, the stewards, or anything about the church. We do have tea. Marion? What's that tea? Yeah. yeah, we've got tea afterwards, so that's thanks, Marion, and the ladies for that. Um, the tea is, you don't have to pay for it, but if you, you're welcome to give us a donation, um, that always just helps to keep it running. And that's a great time of fellowship for us to so get together afterwards and talk about the church and about, about what's happening and get to know each other. Um, and then just the other note, this is Wednesday night. We've got the, um, all the, uh, the, the groups together on Wednesday for an hour, starting at 6. Um, so just come in for an hour instead of your small groups that you go to normally and Bible study groups. Come in, uh, Gus is running a sort of a, a, a group a, a session for this period of Lent. So everybody's there. Are there any other notices that I may have missed out on? Any other things happening? Okay, thank you very much. I can just add, while we're still busy with the offering, on Friday, this Friday, the 1st of March, the Women's World Day of Prayer, and Milnerton Methodist will be hosting a short service from 10 to 11. I know many of us are working, it's not that easy to get away, but if you are available, and if you are a woman, come along to our Women's World Day of Prayer. I will be speaking, so you have to. And we look forward to seeing you there. Let's receive the offering. Heavenly Father, you have given so graciously to us from your hand, so generously. So in our small ways we give back to you, Lord. However small or however big our tithes and offerings are, we know, Lord, that they are worth far more in your hand than if we had held on to them. So we release them to you, Lord. We release the hold that money has over us. We release it into your kingdom, knowing that you can multiply it as you did the loaves and fishes. Bless this money, Lord God, to the extension of your kingdom. This we ask in Christ's name. Be seated. Every church is a little different thing to do the offering. Folks, let's stand and sing again. <laughs> Sunday school. Uh, Sunday school children may leave at this point. Thank you. We'll just give them a moment. But let's be on our feet as we sing Build My Life.
Jesus is our firm foundation. The Word of God is also our firm foundation. Karen will be reading our scriptures this morning. The first is from Genesis and the second is from Mark. Thank you, Karen. First reading is from Genesis 17, verse 1 to 7. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Sorry. Abram fell face down, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come. To be your God and the God of your descendants after you. God also said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name is Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. We also read from Mark 8. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. 
He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along from, with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes to his Father's glory with the holy angels. May God bless our reading, hearing, understanding and doing of his word. Amen. Thank you so much, Karen. I promise I'm not checking my messages. I'm not clutching my phone to check WhatsApps. My elderly dad can't get to church anymore, so whenever I'm preaching, he says, please record your sermon. So that's why I've got my phone up here. Easter Bunny, I'll tell you later why I've got that up here. Just keep you intrigued. Let's come before the Lord before we go into it. Heavenly Father, we thank you that indeed your word, your scriptures, revelation from above are our firm foundation. And as we explore your word this morning, Lord, we ask that you would touch each one of us, perhaps with a different message from person to person, depending on where we are in our walk with you. We simply submit ourselves to the authority of your word this morning, Lord. ask that you would speak to us. In Christ's name, amen. In our passage from Mark that Corin has just read, I find that I can't help feeling a little bit sorry for Peter. He went from one extreme to another in Mark chapter 8. Just a few verses before the passage that we're looking at this morning, he had answered one of the greatest questions in history, and he had answered it correctly. And the question was this. Jesus had asked his disciples, who do people say I am? Disciples had replied, some say you are John the Baptist, others say you are Elijah, still others say you are one of the prophets. What about you, Jesus said, who do you say I am? Peter had answered, you are the Messiah. That was the right answer. The other Gospels, but not Mark, record Jesus' response to Peter's answer. Jesus said to him, You are blessed, Peter. You are the rock on which I will build my church. What a wonderful blessing to receive. Peter in that moment had received acknowledgement that none of the other disciples had got right then. In terms of life's ups and downs, which we all have, this was an up moment. For Peter. But not long after this, as is recorded in our passage today, Jesus started telling his disciples about what lay ahead. That he would suffer many things, be rejected, be killed, and rise on the third day. Our scripture reading goes, Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. We don't know exactly what Peter said, what was his rebuke, but maybe it was something like this. Jesus, no, you cannot suffer. We don't want you to suffer. You are the Messiah. You are destined for greater things. Jesus, in turn, rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan. Talk about going from being top of the pops on the list of disciples to the absolute bottom. In terms of life's ups and downs, this was a down, very down moment for Peter. We need to be clear here, though, that Peter was not, uh, Jesus was not saying that Peter was demon-possessed or Satan in human form, not at all. Satan as a term, as a Hebrew word, simply meant adversary or tempter. I think what Jesus was effectively saying to Peter was, don't be my adversary on this. Don't stand against me on this. I must suffer 
I must go to the cross. And also don't tempt me with the other path, the easy path. I need to take the path of the cross. Now I think in some way we can maybe all relate to Peter. We also, if we'd been one of the disciples, we wouldn't have wanted our beloved Messiah to suffer. And we would have wondered to ourselves how Jesus' death could possibly make anyone's life better. We would have thought that this was maybe a bit illogical. It didn't sound so great, not particularly helpful or fun or encouraging. And remember that we know today that the resurrection happened. We sit on this side of history after the resurrection. Much of what we read about in the Gospels took place before the resurrection. The disciples are on a different side of history to us. Jesus had said to him he would rise again, but the resurrection hadn't happened. It wasn't real for them yet. So we might look at them with a bit of puzzlement, thinking that he was going to rise again. But we know that because we sit on this side of history. They weren't yet able to see the full picture that we now have. So in that light, perhaps we can understand Peter's reservations about the suffering and death of Jesus. We also don't really like the sacrifice and suffering stuff in the Bible. I don't think we really like the verse in our passage today, take up your cross and follow me. Anything that implies suffering and difficulty and challenge we could quite happily gloss over and get to the, the parts about blessing. Maybe we would like to cut out all the parts in Scripture that don't support the prevailing theme that we see in the world around us of live your best life. Look after yourself. Maybe we want to cut out the parts that challenge us to live a life different to what we see in the world around us. We want to cut out the parts that make us feel uncomfortable. But we can't do that. We take God's word as a whole. So what do we do? Mark 8, verse 34. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself, take up their cross, and follow me. Put it in other words, Jesus is saying, if you want to be my disciple, then you've got to give up clutching at this life, your life. Pick up your cross and follow me. It can be a very difficult thing for us to get our heads around uh, when we are surrounded in society by people clutching at this life, at material possession. We live in a me-first culture. People focus on self rather than on selflessness. They focus on gain rather than on sacrifice. And then there's this phrase, live your best life, that I just used. It's the complete opposite to Jesus saying, live the way of the cross. Maybe it's helpful then for us to try and understand what it meant at the time and the context to say, take up your cross. We tend to think of the cross we have to carry in life as a difficult situation, perhaps that has cropped up in our own lives. We tend to think of my cross as my difficult boss, my troubled marriage, my financial struggles, an ill relative, one's own sickness. We tend to think of that as the cross that we must carry. But I want to just suggest to you this morning that it's something bigger and broader than that. See, when the disciples heard Jesus talking about taking up their cross, there was nothing mystical to them about the idea. They didn't think of the cross as a symbol up on the wall. They would immediately have pictured a condemned person carrying along the road the instrument of his execution on his own back. The cross in the time of Jesus was an instrument of execution in the Roman Empire. It was used the torture and death of anyone who dared to raise a hand or speak against the powers that be in the Roman Empire. Crucifixions were a common sight. 
estimated that about 30,000 took place in the Roman Empire just during the lifetime of Jesus alone. So the disciples would have seen this as a common image, a person walking along the road carrying a cross on their back, a person for whom there was no alternative, no opportunity to turn around, a person going only one way, in one direction. That same person carrying their cross to their own execution would also be mocked and jeered, jeered at by bystanders along the road. They had to endure shame. So I want to suggest to you that taking up our cross means that we are prepared to only go one way, in one direction, disciples of Jesus and maybe even suffer for it. This is another part we don't particularly like to think about in our journey as Christians. The word is persecution. We have such great freedom of religion here. It is amazing that we can simply come here on a Sunday morning and worship God. We will not be persecuted for it, but this is unusual. There are many countries around the world where persecution very common. The persecution of Christians started in the very early church, started with the disciples after Jesus' resurrection and ascension. That is the way of the cross. It means suffering, whatever we must suffer in order to be a disciple of Jesus. And it means turning our back on our own lives and going in one way, a long obedience in the same direction. Maybe this doesn't sound very appealing. This does not sound fun. This is the stuff we would prefer to gloss over in the Bible. But I'm going to encourage you now and tell you that to deny yourself and take up your cross is a good thing. This is good news. There is good news in this verse. Because if we look at one of the verses that follows, verse 36 from Mark 8, Jesus said, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? What good is it to follow the way of the world? When we've got the choice to follow the way of the cross, to follow the way of the world, the way of the world is the relentless chasing after power, possessions, prestige, the relentless clutching on to the life that we build for ourselves. And Jesus says, what good is it if you gain all of that, yet lose your soul? Because following the way of the world is soul-destroying. You know this phrase, soul-destroying? We use it quite lightly. Maybe we sit through a boring meeting and then we say to someone afterwards, oh, it was soul-destroying. You know, we use it quite lightly. But actually, following the way of the world kills our soul. It does not bring life. That's what verse 36 is saying. It's a never-ending chase of the stuff. And it does not give you peace. It does not give you long-lasting, deep joy. It does not give you contentment and fulfillment. Scratch under the surface of a life lived the way of the world and you will find it very superficial. I'm not saying we shouldn't enjoy our lives. Don't get me wrong here. There are so many beautiful things we get to do, even beautiful things that we get to have. And yes, we can find pleasure in those things, and that's fine. But if that's all that we're about, experiences and things that we own, if we only focus on our own pleasure and things of the world and not on the things of God, it will ultimately I want to illustrate this principle by using some chocolate. I'm sorry for anyone who gave up chocolate for Lent. I don't mean to tempt you. This Easter bunny, these have been around for decades. You might also remember them from your childhood. I remember as a little girl getting my first Easter bunny like this. Pretty shiny wrapping was so eye-catching. It promised me so much. I opened it. It was this beautiful chocolate bunny, 
didn't even know where to start eating it. So I bit off its ears. I think most of us start at the top. Start at the top, I got at the top. Imagine my shock and horror when I realized it was hollow inside. <laughs> Did not know that I wasn't holding a solid chocolate Easter bunny. I'm older now, of course, so I don't really go and look stuff anymore. I'll probably give it to one of my kids at Easter. But here I have an alternative. This is chocolate I bought at a health shop. This is good for you. It is sweetened with something organic coconut sugar. Man, that is so much better for you than cane sugar. It has got um, organic cocoa butter, um, vanilla beans, uh, which was probably sort of grown in an organic place somewhere with Tibetan monks singing to it over the light of the moon, all sorts of things. Um, it's packaged with sustainable packaging that can be recycled. I sound like I'm a salesperson. I promise you I'm not going to get commissioned if you go and buy these. I'm not getting a kickback. <laughs> but it's got all this goodness inside. But it doesn't look that appealing. Compare the two. Shiny, pretty. Man, this looks amazing. This looks pretty dull. But this is the one that's good for you. And this one is hollow. And it's not that good for you. And I also want to add that this one was more expensive <laughs> than the bunny. The way of the cross is what I'm holding up here. The one that maybe doesn't look so attractive, but it's so much better for you. And there is a price to pay. Yes, there is. There is a price to pay. The way of the cross does demand a price from us. There is a personal cost that comes with denying ourselves walking the way of the cross. But in conclusion, I want to say it is a price worth paying. Because the way of the cross, although it sounds difficult, is the only way that brings us true peace. Knowing that we are following Jesus, come what may. It is the only way that brings us eternal life. It is the only way that brings us true and deep satisfaction knowing that we are reconciled with God and we are walking in Christ's footsteps. The way of the cross gives you life. It gives you something of eternal value. It sounds onerous, following one path only, and maybe even being persecuted for it. But it is the path that leads to life, ultimately. Principle goes all the way back to the Old Testament. It was put before the Israelites in the wilderness and is recorded in Deuteronomy 13, 30, verse 19. I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life so that you and your descendants may live and that you may love the Lord your God, obey him. Hold fast to him, for he is your life. Let us pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you for giving us an alternative to the material shallowness of the world around us. Empower us, Lord God, to walk the way of the cross, difficult though it may be. Help us to encourage each other on this path because we will stumble and we might even fall. With other faithful disciples around us, we can find the courage to continue. Bless us, Lord, as we seek in our humble and frail human way to be your true disciple. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Closing hymn is Be Thou My Vision, which is so such a beautiful choice. This was actually Gus's choice. Indeed, as we walk the way of the cross, Jesus is our vision. God is the one we set our sights on, and that fills our minds. Let's, let's stand and sing. Be Thou My Vision.
to go into this week. We now say the benediction. Same as we do it. to meeting you at the door.